Hello everyone, this is Venom Geek Media here. Uh, before we begin today's video, I'll give a shout out to my new members. These include Robert Renock, Arian Fulton, David W, Adam Bowman, Miles Wright, Chris DeCosta, Jonathan Babbitt, Bo Svensson, Belisarius, David Reeves, and The Puppy Wolf. Welcome aboard. And it's thanks to you guys that I can continue to make videos like this one, uh, even if that are counter to what the algorithm thinks I should be making. But I think you guys. Because I think we all share this interest, even if YouTube can't understand that we do. Uh, and so today I'm going to do a video talking about Marco Inaros. Yes, I know I'm late to the game. But it's something I've really wanted to talk about, and I wanted to wait until the end of the series uh, and before I said anything. So obviously, uh, it goes without saying, spoilers for Series uh, 5 of The Expanse. I'm sure all of you have seen it at this point, or whatever. Uh, if you haven't seen The Expanse, watch it, it is worth it, especially... I actually really liked uh, Series 4. It was actually like an extended episode of Star Trek, in many respects. So, let's talk about Marco Inaros, and other people, other channels, they've talked about, kind of, you know, his personality, his character, his charisma, how does he work, what his objectives are, what his ideology is, and, you know, they've all done that, and I, that's all very interesting. I'm not really interested in that, necessarily. I want to more look at, the reason why I like Marco Inaros, and I think he's a very good character, is because he fits the historical archetype of the revolutionary. Now, the, re the archetype of the revolutionary is something very different to the ideal. The archetype is who, what that actually gen generally ends up being. And Marco Inaros, like, embodies all, like, the historical cliches. Um, that's what makes him so convincing in the role. So, really, I'm just going to break those down and talk about them and, you know look at it as a, as a part of a historical examination of what, what revolution really is. So, I mean, the first thing I, I would talk about, really, is his grievances, the grievances of the belt. Now, the first thing you notice about revolutionaries is they claim to have legitimate grievances, and they do, but they're actually piggybacking off of grievances. So, a lot of countries in Europe in 1847, I think it's 1847, uh, that was the year of revolution all around Europe. Lots of revolutions happened everywhere apart from England because it was raining and no one wanted to turn up. In all seriousness, yeah, revolutions went off all over Europe, made a big impact on the rest of the 19th century and basically created the sort of semi-constitutional monarchies that were there for the rest of the 19th century and early 20th century, but it didn't happen in England. Nothing happened in England. And why? Well, there was a combination of things. What Parliament managed to do, what Prime Ministers managed to do successfully was, so there was a lot of um, anti-revolutionary, uh, there was a lot of reactionary uh, activity after the Napoleonic Wars. There was a deliberate suppression just a little bit after of, you know, revolutionary sentiment that was not okay but then what they did is a lot of them discreetly really discreetly uh they just loosened the valve they didn't look like liberals and that's the important thing and i'll, I'll come back to that um so uh oddly enough sir arthur wellesley the duke of wellington was you know about as english aristocrat and establishment as he you could possibly get in 1825, when he becomes Prime Minister, uh, he passes the Catholic Emancipation Act, which basically allows the Catholic Church back into England. Uh, previously, if you were Catholic in England, well, if you were Catholic clergy, you would have your head chopped off or something along those lines. But he was a Tory. He was a Tory, and he was very much of an establishment family. But he, he snuck that little reform in. And it's like, well, no one's going to think he's, you know, being or too liberal, and there's going to be no uh, threat to him. For that and th that was essentially people like that just gradually freeing up society quietly that's how England uh, avoided revolution throughout the 19th century now it's interesting with the belt because now here's the thing 
if you're a revolutionary, you don't want that. You do not want reform if you are a revolutionary. And I think a lot of people are coming to understand this. Um, what revolutionaries actually desire is the ability to uh, take over themselves and um, dictate power and manifest their vision of the world, which is very different to uh, addressing injustice. Uh, so generally what they'll do is they'll revolutionaries will piggyback off an injustice, which is pretty universally recognised, but they will be exploiting it for their own ends. What is more threatening to a revolutionary than a um, reactionary is a liberal. And so this is where Marco Inaros comes in, and this is where it's interesting when you think about who he actually kills. Again, big spoiler alert. So, who's the first guy he kills? Uh, Ashford. Um, and it's like, why? Well, because, you know, because Ashford's about as belter as you can get. The man's like a, you know, pirate through and through. He's a legend. The belt loves and worships the man. He is a symbol of the belt. And he is a symbol of the old belt. That defiant belt. All of that. So, why does he kill him? Well, because he sold out to the man. You know, or at least that's what, that's what Inaros would say. He sold out, you know. He 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 became part of the establishment. It was a bit like um, you had um, pirates who would actually become go legal, become privateers, because actually they didn't even know they were necessarily being pirates. Uh, but they would be offered the they would offered the chance at one point to just become privateers under the British crown, and a lot of them took that up. But I'm sure there were some hardcores out there who were like, "You're selling out, man," you know. We could keep this going if you did. If you guys didn't sell out, we could keep a good thing going. In killing Ashford, he's removing a potentially dissenting voice that he can't really defend. That Inaros can't really defend against. Inaros, you know, because again, part of his, I, you know, is based on Belter identitarianism, the I idea of Belters for the Belt for Belters and Outer Planets for Belters is, you know, he needs any Belters to agree with him. Okay, so why does he kill Fred Johnson? Well, a different reason, but also on the same pattern. Because he's proof that not all Earthers are bad people. He's proof that not all Earthers are the uh, these oppressive reactionaries. And you might say that he's sort of, you know, he, he has... Fred Johnson has a kind of a saviour complex, what, like an Aros doesn't? Um, <laughs> you know, he's not one to throw stones there. Um, but, you know, Fred Johnson is, you know, he was the respectable semi-respectable face of the OPA. He, you know, well, he basically made them into not a bunch of these feuding factions and into a unified organization that that was actually becoming something. The OPA was becoming like a a recognized, established force. And uh, not just with Fred Johnson, but also, of course, with Anderson Dawes, who has basically disappeared in the story. We just, he, they just mention him. But, um, in, you know, it's mostly been Fred Johnson. Um, but, you know, he's the example of the Earth and the Belt working together. And again, similar thing, of course, why he wants to attack the Rosanante, is that's another symbol of uh, unification and integration that he can't tolerate, because it disproves his argument. His argument is that the Earthers and the Martians, the Inners, they will never accept Belters as equals. And the only way to do so is to wage war against them, wage violent struggle. And again, this is the thing with uh, the revolutionaries and revolutionary ideology, is that they always want the violent struggle. And it's it's like, you don't have to have a violent struggle, but they want it. So, you know, because that's actually, what they're actually after is power, and power, their own power, rather than ascertaining the goals. So, I'm thinking of two historical examples. So, of liberals, because that's basically who Fred Johnson is. He's he's your liberator kind of guy, um, and potentially Nancy Gow. Although I think that was more an accident. That was just luck that he managed to take her out. So with with that, okay. So two historical examples are uh, Tsar Alexander the Second of Russia, the Tsar Liberator. He emancipated the serfs and was doing a lot of liberal reforms. He was too 
publicly liberal and that was the thing because the revolutionaries realized this guy is going to take away you know the anarchists the communists don't exist yet quite yet they're, they're in a proto stage the, the the anarchists are like this guy is going to take away every argument we have we have to off him so they went and they offed him and it's like you know it makes no sense because he was doing what they notionally on the surface what they claimed to want but didn't want it same thing uh with the event that brought about the first world war as Franz Ferdinand, um, and actually you look into the First World War and it's like, that was a whole mess. And what were we, what were we doing defending Serbia? They were, they were, they were a dodgy country, Serbia. I'm not saying that about Serbia today, to be clear, but their conduct back in the pre-war years, it was like, I could think of some things we call them today. They certainly weren't playing cricket, that's for sure. Why did they assassinate Franz Ferdinand? not necessarily I don't think it was just because Franz Ferdinand was the crown prince of Austria although that was a pretty good reason um, but the main reason was because he was a liberal he was going to try and pass some reforms to liberate the Slavic minorities in the Austro-Hungarian Empire what the Black Hand gang and Serbia basically wants is for a violent... They don't want that because that would then deprive them of their legitimacy and territorial claims. They want a Slavic uprising, which then means that, well, they and Russia can justify themselves and swoop in to claim all, you know, all these territories uh, of the Slavic minorities and say, we are now protecting our, our Slavic brethren. That's what they actually wanted to do. Uh, that's why they assassinated Franz Ferdinand, because he threatened to take away their argument. So that's one aspect in which, basically, on a when it, when it comes to dealing with people, why Anaris is killing the people that he is. The other thing I want to talk about with Anaris is, uh, basically, revolutionaries always strike with the last chance. They always go on the last chance. So, because basically, with the ring... The whole, you know, paradigm of, you know, the the belt and the inners, that, that you know, black and white view that Inaros holds, that's gone, or that's about to go. It's it's on its way out as a view of the world. Um, and ironically, it is that which has given him his ability, because otherwise, you know, what, what was he? He was a belter in a junk ship, and, you know, he had some clever ideas, sure, wager, you know, a... a pirate campaign and whereas waging what he is now which is basically a, a guerrilla almost semi-conventional campaign um against um semi-asymmetric campaign against the inners um you know he's using a combination of yes um guerrilla tactics with his meteorites but he's also got a conventional force of of ships but he derives that from the changes that have arisen um because of the ring. Because the ring meant that Mars was basically done and they've just got all this equipment that's just laying around and you what, you're just gonna, you know, leave that around for anyone? No, you're gonna sell it, of course. You don't want it collecting dust. I mean again, great parallel with you know, it's like you know, partially the reason as to why there's so much Soviet equipment out in the world still today. Well, because, you know, when the Soviet Union fell it's like they've still got stuff. They've got all these tanks and planes and things. And it's like you've got to do something with them. You don't want them just collecting dust. You're already skint. So, of course, they're going to sell them off. And it's so, ironically, the thing that is destroying his position and his paradigm, the thing that really threatens Marco Inaris' worldview, the ring, that is what has given him the opportunity to mount this campaign because it's given him those it's a, it's made it so that he can buy those martian ships and actually have and there's a question to whether or not he could have done this without those martian ships i think you know looking at some of it maybe he could have um what those martian ships really do for the free navy is give them a nucleus to form under and basically yeah a semi offer a, a kind of a semi organized a semi professional force uh comparable in many ways or in fact superior to the OPA 
because they're unified under one leader, whereas the OPA is still factioned. They're a little bit more formalized now and polished up, but, you know, they are not unified under a single leader in the way that the Free Navy are. And that's the other thing that, again, as a revolutionary, um, that plays a big part. So, uh, with the when the Tsar abdicated, you had a bunch of different people vying for power. Uh, you had you did, you had various forms of democrats and so on and so forth. You had all sort you had your Mensheviks and everything. But okay, why did the Bolsheviks win? Well, because they were under a single leader, Lenin, and he had he carried out totalizing power. Um, you know, Lenin was definitely a tyrant. He had to be in order to in order to carry out that revolution. You couldn't not. Um, and so, when faced with people, you know, who were prepared to compromise, um, he was of course going to win because he wasn't prepared to compromise. And again, similar thing with Anaros. You know, now whether he'll win is another question. Uh, that's to be resolved in series six, the last one apparently, which I think is a terrible shame. That's why the Free Navy is a, I don't know, su successful. We don't know yet. Is the is the powerful revolutionary force that it is, as opposed to uh, groups like the OPA, and you know you think about that in uh, in the modern world, you have your um, you know why Daesh, as I'm going to call them, was so scary was because it was this unified thing, it was this monolithic thing, whereas you know a lot of the other groups in Syria were basically hodgepodge groups of militias that were broadly associated and broadly had some broad agreements and disagreements and you know one couldn't exactly be counted to help one another and yeah that's always gonna struggle when faced with something that is unified under a totalizing uh will power there are inherent contradictions in in the in you know basically how the free navy has gained its reputation and its power and what it notionally stands for, because, you know, it's doing all these things, but it's using the advantages generated by the ring. And the ring is making Marco Inaris's perspective invalid. The belt's over. Mars is over. Those things don't exist. Or won't exist uh, for too much longer. It's, you know, why in at least a lot of the Western world, I think anyone semi serious at least realizes why marxism doesn't have the appeal it did is because the the tradition the traditional working class particularly in england the traditional working class is gone the number of people who would have previously been working class but are now actually a a form of middle class have have extended and that's a thing that was going to happen with belters they were going to get what they wanted and that's why Marco Inaris had to take such violent action in the hope of provoking the irrational response from Earth that Earth initially does before Avasarala takes power. Um, he needs those responses to, uh, in order to make people doubt or forget what they know or, for, or forget what they are seeing and revert back to those traditional narratives of, you know, the in you know the belters versus the inners you know that's what he needs to do and that's why he takes the actions that he does um so those are just my thoughts um what are yours let me know in the comments below um if you enjoyed this video uh either consider becoming a channel member or you can just do a one-off donation to my paypal but it would be really helpful like i say i don't know if the youtube algorithm is gonna show this to many people or if it's just gonna just gonna be for my subscribers but um that would be much appreciated and I will see you guys in the next video.